technical issues and we may still oh no we are oh, we are we on camera, camera. Um, er, earlier so we're moving now on to item number three on the agenda which is apologies and we don't have any apologies this morning um, and just would like to welcome to um, the committee Mervyn Story who has um, taken over from Gordon Dunn and we, we would like to thank Gordon for his work on the committee and wish him a, a speedy recovery as well. So moving on then to item number four, um, there is a copy of the draft minutes from the meeting held on the 23rd of March at page 29 of your packs. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Thank you. Okay. Um, there is a copy of the draft minutes from the meeting held on the 24th of March at page 40 in the pack. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then there is a copy of the draft minutes from the concurrent meeting between Economy, Infrastructure and ERA committees held on the 24th of March at page 44 of your pack. So are members content that those are... Um, a accurate reflection of that meeting and those minutes also have to be agreed by the other committees. So are members content? That should be happy. Okay, uh, thank you. Chair, I, I just did notification of apologies from Mr Storey. Okay, thank you, Peter. So moving on then to item number two on the agenda, which is our briefing from the department and Fibris on Project Stratum. There is a departmental briefing paper at page five of your pack and a presentation from Fibrous at page 13. Um, just also to remind members that the clerk emailed um, a memo regarding the session to members yesterday that wasn't included in the pack when it went out. So just to welcome to um, this morning's meeting, uh, Geraldine Fee, Director of Tourism and Telecoms and DFE, Nigel Robbins, Project Director at DFE, Trevor Forsyth, Project Manager at DFE, Connell Henry, Chairman of Fibrous, Dominic Kearns, Chief Executive of Fibrous, Shane Haslam, Project Director of Project Stratum for Fibrous, and Steve Edwards, Project Director of Project Stratum for Fibrous. So if I hand over to yourselves to make an opening statement and then we'll bring members in for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam um, Members, thank you very much for the invite to address the committee today. Uh, just by way of Connell Henry. I'm the founder and chair of Fibrous, and after me, you'll hear from Dominic Kearns, my co founder and CEO. Dominic will give members a picture of the overall plan for Stratum or for Fibrous and the progress that we're making against that plan. Then, Steve Edwards, our Project Stratum program director, will outline the Stratum rollout plan and try to give you a sense of the challenges involved in that rollout and how we're addressing those challenges. Then you'll hear from Shane Aslam, who is our Commercial and Projects Director. Shane will give us the details on how we are engaging with local communities and with the wider market to make sure that Stratum has the impact that we all wanted to have. And after you've heard from Shane, we should have plenty of time for questions and answers. So just before hearing from the team, I thought it would be useful just to remind ourselves about what's this, what this is all about and why it's important. Broadband is a generational infrastructure. About once every century, there comes along a new infrastructure that transforms the way we live our lives and form our society. In the 18th century, it was canals. In the 19th century, it was railways. And in the 20th century, it was electricity. Fiber broadband is the generational infrastructure of the 21st century. It can and it will transform our society and our economy. High quality broadband changes everything. It changes the way we educate, the way we interact, it changes the way we transact, and increasingly it's transforming the way we care for our most willing people. Pause for just a second. Um, Conal, yeah. the, the, the slides that you're um, showing, the, the initial one said commercial and confidence. Now we're in an open session here. Um, so your, um, your, your slides are being broadcast. Is that. Dominic? Dominic? Uh, I think I think it's okay, Connell. There's nothing commercial within the slides. Uh, okay. Hey, okay. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, and thanks for thanks for checking in on that because yeah, stuff like that can happen. Um, so what, as I was saying, um, high quality broadband changes everything. Changes the way we educate. It changes the way we interact. It changes the way we transact, and increasingly, it changes the way we 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 deal with our most vulnerable. Um, 
because fundamentally access to broadband is about access to goods and services, broadband is most beneficial then to those who previously had least access to goods and services, and that is our poor and those people living in rural and regional communities. And yet it is those regional and rural communities who stand to benefit the most from broadband that have been left behind by the rollout of broadband by the TV and phone companies. And that's why Dominic and I founded Fibrous. We're a regional broadband company building 100% fiber broadband networks. We don't have a legacy copper network that we use to sell and broadband. And crucially, we're focused only on rural and regional areas. Not a penny of our 350 million investment program for Northern Ireland will be spent connecting homes in Belfast or Derry. As part of, of this program, we have convinced InfraCapital to, to come and to invest in Fibrous and in Northern Ireland. InfraCapital is the investment arm of M&G PLC, one of Europe's largest investment managers, with almost 370 billion of assets under management. Working with my team, InfraCapital are excited by the potential of Northern Ireland as a place for investment. Finally, I wanted to say a word about the Stratum process and the Stratum team under Nigel, Pro Nigel Robbins. The Stratum process has been conducted by the book, on time, and in a professional and expert manner. In a process such as this, delivering on schedule and without significant challenge is not the norm. One only needs to look at the significant delays and arguments associated with R100 in Scotland and the National Broadband Plan in the Republic of Ireland to show how such delays can infect the project and fundamentally undermine and frustrate the policy objectives. So the combination of stratum being procured on time and fibres delivering stratum on time means that Northern Ireland has quietly leapt to the front of the queue of places most likely to deliver 100% fibre broadband coverage. And it's up to us all to make the most of this once in a lifetime opportunity for our society and for our economy. So I'll hand over now to Dominic to take you through the details. Dominic, you're on mute. Okay. Um, thanks, Connell. Uh, Dominic Kearns, Chief Executive of Fibrous. And I thank the committee for, for the opportunity today to present to you. Um, Fibrous, as you will know, is a homegrown full fibre broadband operator based in Belfast and over the last two years has recruited over 160 talented and experienced people to our organisation. When we founded this company, our objectives were very clear. We wanted to play our part in bringing the digital infrastructure out of the 20th century and into the 21st. The benefits are endless for this future proof network. But most importantly, and at the heart of this, it creates competition in the market and choice for the consumer. When we began our commercial rollout in late 2019, and our, pla our plan was to address over 100 regional and rural towns and villages covering over 150,000 premises. This commitment to our local economy came off the back of the company being bought and capitalized by our investors in for capital. I'm pleased to say that this project is on course and this month will have delivered over 35,000 premises with full fibre broadband. In November of last year, we were delighted to sign the contract to deliver Project Stratum for the executive. This project is a lifeline for so many of our rural dwellers and businesses and we are now fully focused on delivering for all those people. This project of over 76,000 premises combined with our commercially funded rollout brings our total build over the next three years to 225,000 premises, which represents just over 25% of the homes here. In total, this will see £350 million worth of infrastructure investment from Fibrous and the NI Executive, making this one of the largest infrastructure investments ever seen here. Recently, and just after three months from contract signature, we connected our first customers to the Stratum network. This was our commitment under the contract, to deliver straight away and at pace. Despite operating in a restricted environment because of the pandemic, this was a major milestone for the project and our organisation. It put to bed the theory that the industry needed nine months to mobilise before starting the rollout. It's a model for success for these types of projects. Those with the greatest incentive want to get on with it. I am very proud of the commitment and the work of all our people have worked through the pandemic safely and with the project at the forefront of their minds. 
An element of our approach and a key difference from previous interventions was to ensure transparency of rollout and to let people know exactly when they would receive their service. Our rollout is designed and planned to ensure we reach as many homes as possible and as efficiently as we can. This means that there has to be areas at the end of our rollout. Our commitment to those areas is that we will be there and deliver on time. With this huge investment creates massive opportunity for the supply chain and the local market. With a bottleneck in specialist fibre resources across Ireland and the UK to deliver this network, our supply chain has created over 150, 250 new jobs of specially trained operatives and project manager, managers. It has also opened a new training and learning centre for graduates and apprentices to harness long-term career and work opportunities in our industry. Full fibre broadband provides homes and businesses with infinite connectivity to the outside world. It has the ability to change people's lives. Should it be the pupil looking to access their online schoolwork, the graduate being able to apply for a job with a multinational company with the ability to work from home, or our elderly having seamless interaction with a doctor via an e-health service, it changes people's lives. For that reason and the confidence shown by our investors, we are looking at the opportunities to extending our network reach further. The UK government has outlined ambitious targets to be achieved by 2025 under the new programme Project Gigabit. We plan to do our bit to help achieve these targets in Northern Ireland and welcome the new regulated arrangement set out by Ofcom to create this investment environment. Off the back of this, we hope to announce soon an extension of our commercial rollout plan to address more homes and businesses that are in need of this technology. Our organisation and our people are committed to delivering transformational change to our digital infrastructure, and we very much welcome the opportunity today to give you a sense of our progress to date. So I'd like to invite colleagues Steve Edwards and, and Shane to outline some of that progress. Thank you. Thanks, Dom. Um, Steve Edwards here. Um, just to, first of all, put some uh, some of the big scary numbers around uh, the program that uh, some of you will be aware of. Um, it's a huge task to complete Project Stratum. You can see here we, we've got 16,000 kilometres of fibre cable to deploy. We're targeting more than 76,000 premises through the project currently um, and, and the project will run over the next three years. We're looking wherever we can to build network using existing infrastructure that improves uh, efficiency and time to deploy and also um, reduces the disruption to local communities. Um, and if you see some of the numbers there, nearly a quarter of a million poles that our engineers will need to climb to complete the network. Um, we think that's the equivalent of uh, climbing Mount Everest. And sometimes the project feels like that but um, it's certainly uh, a great achievement when completed. Looking at the phasing and the rollout plan, as Dom said, we made a commitment to publish our uh, deployment plan early. And within, I think, a week of signing the contract, we'd done that. Uh, by Christmas, we had a website up and running that um, allowed people to go on, put postcodes in and see when they will um, benefit from Project Stratum. Now, part of that commitment is also that this will change. So um, we wanted to be transparent. We wanted to, um, to, 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 to show people where and when the network would be built, but also when it changes, We'll tell, we'll tell the communities, we'll tell yourselves why it's changed and we'll explain um, why that is happening. And that's part of our ongoing commitment um, to, to you and to the communities that we're serving. You can see on the map, we've divided the project into, a, into 52 phases. Uh, each of them, uh, as published on the website, have a, have a delivery date assigned to them based on the colors that you can see on the map. We often get asked why we've chosen to deploy in the order that we have. 
And there are three things that, that dictate that deployment plan. First of all, the engineering. We obviously have to deploy this network in an efficient manner and uh, use of existing infrastructure, the condition of that infrastructure and the location of the backhaul plays a big part in, in determining the rollout plan. Secondly, economic considerations. We're using public money to build this network. We have to do it efficiently. We have to do it in a way that um, manages that cost and gets the best benefit for the public investment. And finally, time to deploy. We have to deploy this network by March 2024, and therefore we have to do it in a way that maximizes the resources available to us and allows us to complete that rollout by the deadline. So it's really about the, the, the efficiency of deployment, the time to deploy, and all driven by delivering as many premises as early as possible um, in order to deliver Project Stratum. So how are we doing? Um, we, we've got this slide, we call this slide the first 130 days. Don mentioned that we, um, we set out with a huge ambition to, to uh, uh, do something called a vertical takeoff, which meant that we actually started building the network the day the contract was signed. The picture on this slide shows the first pole going up and this is on the day, actually, while the contract was being signed, this poll was being put up, and we've continued at that pace since. It's really extraordinary how fast we've been able to mobilise and, and, um, and get the programme going, and that's driven by our incentives. It's a shared incentive with ourselves and DFE to deploy this network as quickly as we possibly can. Um, it, it, won't, it won't be lost on some of you that often um, in industry and most of the BDUK projects that we're aware of, there's a six to nine month gap between contract signature and the first uh, customers going live. Um, our first customers went live um, 96 days after contract signature and um, we've now completed nearly 1,500 premises um, uh, already by the end of March, where we've achieved that first quarterly milestone. We're already building um, across, uh, I think it's now five areas, um, we're around 6,000 premises in build, in Cull Island, Killilay, Ballycastle, Kilkeel, Castlewell and Warren Point. And the remainder of the phases to be completed in 2021 are now in planning and survey stage and the high level design for all of those um, around 20,000 premises to be delivered in uh, or 19,000 premises to be delivered in 2021 is, is now completed. And as you can see on the slide, we've already um, installed over 20 kilometers of new duct. We've, we've placed new poles, new fibrous poles around 1,400 and 335 kilometers of fiber cable installed already. In doing this um, mobilization and rapid deployment, we're, we're looking at the benefits delivered to the economy and in particular jobs and skills. You can see from the slide here, some of our partners uh, Integro, who plan and design the network for us, and Charles Brand, who complete the uh, the fibre and uh, uh, civil works. Viber Optics are a partner of ours who bring on people, train uh, train people for those uh, technical engineering skills that we use in the program. And not shown on this slide currently, uh, we're now we've now brought on board a second supplier, um, which is uh, KN some of you will be aware, and uh, they're now underway as well. So, so far, Fibrous themselves have recruited 136 new roles. Fiber Optics have now got 172 people in their program, and Charles Brand have well over 50 new roles completed to date. So the economic benefits of the program are starting to be seen already. Um, we're also on track to meet our 
social commitments uh, with new new engineering new, new entrant trainees we've committed to deliver 2600 or more hours uh, uh, weeks of training over the course of the program and um, a, a large number of those roles will be in technical um, and high high quality roles in the design build and operation of the network um, and we're on track at the moment in delivering that commitment quickly looking at how we're managing the risks and, and, and managing the project generally um, Connell mentioned um, the way that we're working well with uh, the DFE team with Nigel and, and the team um, and we're looking very closely at uh, risks in the project um, and some of these are shared risks as you can see here um, the obvious ones COVID and Brexit uh, we have had some issues um, but all of those have been have been overcome um, as you can imagine working relationships have working arrangements have been impacted um, on uh, due to COVID uh, we've been affected in, in, in terms of the crew sizes and proximity of working. We've overcome this by increasing the number of crews deployed uh, on the network. With Brexit, we have had some issues with materials delivery. We took uh, action very early in the programme to secure uh, materials for the large items uh, that, we, that we may have expected to have delivery issues with. We have since had some additional issues with some smaller components uh, which, which we've managed to overcome and it's not entirely clear whether those um, supply issues are Brexit related or Covid related because obviously down the supply chain um, the manufacturers um, and distributors are also affected by Covid. And the third large area of risk to the programme is the, um, the use of existing infrastructure um, we are working very closely with OpenReach, whose network we are using for a large part of the deployment. Um, we do have um, some concerns over the, some of the times quoted for pole replacements, but we haven't had any major impacts to the program at this stage. Uh, it continues to be an area of focus for us, um, and the process for PIA still remains rather clunky, but we are very pleased that OpenReach are responding positively and also considering initiatives to uh, adapt and address uh, large scale deployments of uh, uh, using uh, passive infrastructure access. And um, we, uh, we, we're very pleased that OpenReach are responding positively to those suggestions. It's clearly in the interest of all parties that, that Stratum is a success. Um, Stratum in its use of uh, open reach infrastructure will sort of be a benchmark for the ambitions of the UK in terms of its gigabit ambitions uh, where similar deployments will be necessary in order for the UK to meet those targets so we're very aware that Stratum needs to be successful to prove that case and as I said um, we 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 work in closely on these and 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 program governance with the DFE team, we um, we value the the um, scrutiny and help that DFE have given us um, so far. Um, we're very aware this is a public funded contract, hence um, we've taken measures to ensure transparency, and we welcome that scrutiny. Um, and we also recognise the importance of, of this programme to the community. So we want to continue to share with you our deployment plans as it changes and adapts and we'll keep everybody informed as we progress. And on, on that note, uh, Shane will take us through the Stakeholder and Comms programme. Thanks, Steve. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Shane Haslam, uh, Project and Commercial Director with Fibrous. Uh, I'm going to take you through uh, the progress that's been made thus far in relation to stakeholder and comms for Project Stratum. So uh, if, I, if I could maybe start uh, by following on from the comments made by colleagues in relation to the approach that, that has driven how we've uh, approached 
how effectively the build uh, from a project stratum perspective, but more importantly, how we liaise with communities and stakeholders during that build itself. That's at the forefront, forefront of our thinking uh, as we approach uh, the build. Uh, as part of our solution, uh, we developed a robust uh, stakeholder and communications plan uh, that has been scrutinized by our colleagues in DFE. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that that uh, stakeholder and communications plan is now in full operation. Uh, if, I, if I could draw your attention to, uh, first of all, chat about the, the brand effectively, we've deployed a new brand uh, for Project Stratum, uh, which is known as Hyperfast NI. Uh, all information relating to the build and updates within the project will be provided effectively under this brand uh, to the market itself. You'll see on the right hand of the slide some of the artwork that we've used thus far. You know, the brand focuses on delivering high speed broadband to rural communities across NI and, and the banner that we've used with the rural revolution pretty much sums up you know, our approach to, to Project Stratum and what Project Stratum is going to effectively mean. We understand the importance of delivering high speed broadband uh, across rural parts of NI and the, and the differences effectively that that will make to rural communities, uh, both in terms of how they live and work uh, on a daily basis. Uh, in terms of the hyperfast website on the left hand side, uh, we've done a, a significant amount of development work over the last number of months. We launched the website in December of, of last year, uh, just after signing the contract itself, pretty much in the spirit that you know, where we're delivering uh, connectivity from a project stratum perspective, that that's a source whereby uh, users and communities effectively can engage with us to understand when project stratum is coming to their area, but more importantly, when it's going to be delivered effectively and when the services will be made available. This, is all, this offers a completely transparent view of the rollout as the project itself progresses. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the, the website itself continues to be developed and we're actually just about to launch a, a new version effectively of the website, which will provide lots more information in terms of how the project itself is progressing uh, and, uh, and, and changes to uh, how we are uh, updating uh, uh, connectivity from a, from a customer perspective. Uh, we've worked very closely with the DFE team uh, to ensure that the information that we provide on the website itself using our, our address checker operates at a, at a per premise address perspective. And what that effectively means is, you know, the public can effectively connect into the website itself, put in the location where they're, where they're based, and then they'll get a result in terms of when we hope uh, Project Stratum to, to deliver connectivity within their area. Uh, as the guys had said previously, this is completely and totally alien to projects of this type. Uh, our, our focus is all about transparency to ensure that as the project itself progresses, that uh, we, we're able to provide those updates on a, on a timely basis and, and communities and, and, uh, and users can, can get that access uh, pretty much at the touch of a button. Okay. So if you could just move on. Okay, so I'm going to chat a little bit about about the the engagement and inquiries. So uh, obviously we we liaise with the public through all the usual social media channels, and at this stage we've uh, dedicated a uh, stakeholder manager in place. Uh, we've dealt with over 1,900 inquiries to date and have held over 40 plus meetings with MLAs, MPs and councillors on the project stratum project thus far. Uh, pleased to say we've recruited our first uh, fibre ambassador, uh, whose important job will be to work with local communities to create awareness and provide updates before and during build uh, to ensure that obviously as the build progresses, uh, that it's dealt with on a smooth basis, that we keep the communities abreast of how the project itself is being delivered within those communities, deal with inquiries as those inquiries come in uh, to ensure that the project itself obviously runs smoothly. Uh, they'll also liaise with obviously local planning and environmental agencies such as the rural community networks as required. We've, during lockdown, uh, had to operate uh, in a slightly different uh, different mode as we all have uh, using using virtual connectivity. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, we've already initiated uh, a number of virtual uh, awareness events uh, where we've held it within the areas that we are either building or going to build. 
uh, uh, we've held those 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 virtual events to provide an update on Project Stratum, on what Project Stratum is all about, the differences it's going to make, obviously, within those communities, and when we're hoping, obviously, to go to those communities to build. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that the 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 reaction that we've seen thus far in terms of attendees has been has been really impressive, and, and we're pleased with the with the interest thus far. Uh, we and. As we move move into April, we have another five uh, uh, virtual events that are that are pending for to be completed in April. Uh, we've initiated discussions with various parties relating to digital inclusion activities, uh, and we hope to uh, progress those discussions in further detail over the coming weeks and months. And as part of our our promise under Project Sodom, we have committed to uh, volunteering. Uh, and again, I'm pleased to say that from, from our perspective, we have uh, uh, totted up just over 30 plus hours to date of, of uh, volunteering in relation to digital inclusion and within our, uh, our own virtual events that have been completed thus far. Uh, as far as the, uh, the Fiber Ambassadors are concerned, uh, they'll also liaise with your rural community networks. So we've been liaising, you'll see a number of them listed on the, uh, on the slide, uh, where we would liaise with you know, the environmental agencies, the local squirrels, and so on and so forth, to ensure that you know, any work that we're completing within the areas itself is dealt with on a timely basis. And we take into account, obviously, the, a lot of the additional uh, requirements required in order to, to, to provide the connectivity on time. Okay, so that's me, folks. Uh, I will now move on to questions and answers for the group. Okay, thank you. Um, are officials making any statement at this point? Or are we moving straight into Q and A? Con content to move into Q and A, Chair. If if you're content, thank yep. you. Yep, thank you. Um, I just have, I suppose have a, a couple of quick questions for Fribus, first of all, um, and thanks very much for the update and um, and the the briefing around the rollout. It, it, it is useful to get that, and and I'm one of those MLAs that have has met uh, with you to talk about the rollout in, in my own constituency area, um, and just I suppose to go back to the. The, uh, the briefing paper we got from the department about Project Stratum and, and the rollout, and you referred to it there in your, your briefing as well, um, that there have been some issues in terms of being able to access the existing open reach network. Um, it, how significant are those issues, and uh, do you see that impacting um, to any uh, particular degree on the, the timescale for rollout? I'll take that one. Okay, sure. Yeah. The um, yeah. First of all, we haven't hit any 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 uh, issues yet. It's an area that we're worried about because it's uh, an area that we're very dependent on open reach to do something called network adjustments. Um, but we're very pleased with the response that we've had from open reach. Uh, we've met open reach at a very senior level, and they're listening to uh, ideas. Um, and, and making changes to, to help us and, and help other operators who are deploying on, on PIA yeah, using, using operating infrastructure. So, um, you know, we've had, we've had some individual areas where we, we've got long lead times, but that's to be expected. And so far, no delay, no delay to our program at all. Fiber have a very good working relationship with, with OpenReach, and that's uh, proving to be very useful. Okay, thanks for that. And so, can I just ask a question about how you decided which areas would be rolled out in that order? Because that that's something, as you will understand, um, constituents are, are particularly exercised about, especially if they're, um, you know, later in in the planned rollout. So, how was the decision about which premises or which areas um, would be rolled out first reached? Okay, so I think I said in, uh, in in my part that there are three there are three things that drive that order of deployment. First, the engineering, then the economics value for money, and third, the you know the time to deploy and the use of resources. We're always focused on trying to deliver as many premises as we can in as short a time as possible. 
and clearly we have to deliver the whole program by March 2024. That's very challenging. So we have to deploy in an order that's dictated by the engineering, the economic and efficiency delivery and the efficient use of resources. And that's how we've come up with the order that we have. Okay, so well, what, what does that mean in, in practicality? Is it the easiest areas first or the more difficult ones or, or is there a mix? Yeah, it is, it is, there is a mix and when we, we're not, we're not doing the easy premises first. So when we do an area, um, we've divided the, the, the deployment into 52 areas. That's based on the technology that we're deploying. But we're doing all the premises in that area um, within that phase. So the hardest to reach, as well as the closest to the network, the easiest to reach, are being done at the same time. It's just that the logical phasing of which geographies we're active in at, at any point in the program, we have to have, you know, we have to have a, um, a deployment sequence and we've developed the best possible deployment sequence to ensure that we deliver all the premises by March 2024. Just to add to that, Steve, if I may, uh, it was important that the department uh, didn't influence any of the bidders under Project Stratum in the ITD documentation, but did influence the pace uh, so that, um, as uh, uh, Mr. Edwards states, we could get to as many premises as possible with the available public funding. But we've considered and still do consider the entire intervention area to be a priority as uh, more than two thirds uh, can't access speeds of 15, let alone 30 uh, megabits. So the real the, the race is on really for fibrous to complete the intervention in that the constraints of that time frame um, which has dictated dictated the engineering of the 52 areas in, in the way that uh, steve has described okay uh, just, uh, just through the chair uh, again just to me at a, at a conceptual level um we said in our bid and we we act all day every day the only rationale we are using for rollout is efficiency so they're, 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 we're not targeting any particular part of Northern Ireland, any particular type of premises. There's nothing else other than efficient rollout of premises. Um, and whilst we're happy to work with elected reps and with uh, community engagement groups to discuss that rollout and show people how that rollout is progressing, I would want to say that we're not really open for business to renegotiate that. It's, it's, it's a crucial part of the rollout plan that we keep it locked in the way it is because that is the most efficient way to do it and that um, these projects can get sidelined by people looking to, you know, you know as, as you can imagine, by people looking to move themselves or their interest or somebody else up the queue. We're not going to do that. We're going to stick with the program at its most efficient because efficient delivery of the whole project delivers the maximum benefit at the most, at the most rapid amount of time. No, and I think that um, as committee members and elected reps, we, we will appreciate that. And um, I think the, the issue is understanding what drives that efficiency so that we can effectively communicate that to, to our constituents. So I think it is important that we understand what is meant by efficiency so that when people are coming to us and saying, well, why am I not getting uh, connected to 2023, yeah. that we are able to uh, effectively yeah. explain yeah, and we, 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 we're available at all times. If, 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 if our answers aren't satisfying any members here today, we're available at all times to work individually with members or with groups to walk through at a general level and on the ground exactly how that how that actually manifests itself. I simply wanted to say that, that it is the primary and the sole rationale for our rollout plan. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, and I suppose just to pick up on a, another point, um, we are aware from the, the outset of the project um, that there are an additional two and a half thousand premises not initially included, uh, but I understand from conversations with Fibris that those are still being included in the, the address checker. Um, so are they included in the planned phased rollout as it stands at the minute in terms of the colour-coded map that you have um, presented today and, and I suppose in terms of the conversations you're having with elected reps, are those premises included in that rollout plan? Uh, 
Go on. Okay. Take yeah, yeah. So, so um, the all the premises um, are included in the address checker. So, you, so, so if somebody puts their postcode and address in, they'll see their status. If they're in the two five one seven, which are the premises that that we're not currently um, scheduled to deploy to, then they'll they'll get that message. So they'll be able to see that they're in that category of premise, if you will. We, um, we're currently working um, with DFE to bring those premises into the program and we have proposals um, being prepared um, now that will that'll allow those to be brought into the program. And just to add to that, uh, Chair, we, we hope by the um, through the summer period to uh, draw final conclusions through further engagement with uh, DCMS uh, in order to secure additional funding under the headroom funding provision to bring those premises into scope. That's always been the intention to maximise coverage. Um, network bill costs are significant and certainly uh, for a startup which Fibrous is, there are significant costs. So the 165 million um, was never a budget. It was a significant sum of money to address a problem. Um, so further funding is required to uh, to complete that task and to address some of the particularly hard to reach premises. So it remains our aspiration not to not to leave any eligible premises behind. Okay. Um, and I suppose just a final question for me, and this is probably more for um, department officials, but we, we know that there were I think something in the region of 18,000 premises de-scoped from the original intervention area. So just I suppose to understand what work is being done by the department to ensure that you know, high speed broadband or super fast broadband is being delivered to those premises in, alongside the rollout of Project Stratum. And I know that uh, yesterday there was press about OpenReach having 100, 100 million of investment um, in broadband as well. Uh, does the department have any engagement in terms of how that is being rolled out um, to ensure that all of those um, who don't currently have access to to the, the, the 30 meg are, are at this moment in time are actually going to get it? Yes, so colleagues may wish to add to this, uh, Chair, but um, we certainly think it's important as the department to engage positively and transparently with uh, all telecoms infrastructure providers, so BT OpenReach, Fibers, of course, Virgin Media, and there's been a significant amount of very welcome investment, um, some of which was announced this week by OpenReach, which is good news for the citizen and for businesses. Um, we're very much focused on that 10, 11% of premises in Northern Ireland that uh, uh, do not benefit from, at the moment, access to gigabit capable broadband and we're uh, aiming to close that connectivity gap through Project Stratum. So the data landscape uh, is and has been a complicated one, but it uh, naturally there, there is a, an extent of an evolving landscape. But the premises that were descoped that uh, you'd referenced were descoped uh, at the beginning of the ITT process, and that was as a result of a, a data refresh exercise uh, by uh, a, a national on a national level by a major infrastructure provider um, and we took the opportunity to reach out to other bidders at the project at the time to update data. So 19,000 premises were descoped, so the majority of those as a result of that national data refresh exercise because uh, the supplier indicated that premises could or would soon be able to access uh, next generation access broadband. Now, we, we have identified there are some premises that we will uh, need to uh, make clarifications with through further engagement with uh, that supplier, so which we're in the process of addressing. Um, it's also important, I think, to point out that uh, there have, since the contract was awarded, and uh, I think this is testament to the transparency that uh, Fibus were talking about, and uh, we certainly commend uh, the efforts of Connell, Dominic, Steve, and the team um, under Shane as well, uh, because that transparency has resulted in a postcode checker that was widely publicized, and there's very strong community engagement from Fibrous and a great spirit of endeavor and can do, which we greatly appreciate. But we've uh, identified between ourselves and through working with colleagues at Land and Property Services that there would uh, appear to be what we could describe as some gaps in the point of data set, which was used to inform the intervention area for Project Stratum 
So we're working through those issues, but we would encourage any citizens or indeed local councils to notify us of, uh, if you feel there are premises that are currently not captured on the hyperfast uh, address checker. Um, if, for example, a property that has been occupied for a number of years uh, it has neighbours who are in the project stratum intervention area, there is a, a possibility that the, the data anomalies I've described associated with the point of data set uh, might uh, require that premises to be folded into the project under the state aid rules that allow any white postcode uh, premises that are deemed to be eligible uh, to benefit from the intervention. So we're focusing on those issues and working through those with Fibrous and uh, with colleagues at LPS uh, with one um, purpose in mind, to ensure that any eligible premises are not left behind, uh, are uh, hopefully benefiting from this project subject to uh, the confirmation of that uh, headroom funding and VFM uh, considerations. But that's certainly, that's certainly the aim, be it premises that were de-scoped as a result of a data refresh exercise or premises that uh, find themselves uh, not uh, receiving a certain classification on pointer. All right, thanks for that, Nigel, because certainly I know of um, colleagues who have been contacted by constituents in, in that situation where neighbours are within the intervention area and they aren't and they feel they should be. Um, and it would be, I suppose, useful for those people to ensure that they are in contact with the department um, uh, just to make them aware of that and I suppose then to get an understanding of whether they, they should be within the intervention area or they are uh, in that category of premises that were de-scoped and if so then I suppose we need to be also putting pressure on those infrastructure providers who, to, do, to ensure that those premises are commercially um, connected over the next short while as well. So. Uh, I think it is important that we get a full understanding of, of the data in respect of that as quickly as possible. I'm just going to bring in yeah. um, other members for questions. Can we bring Stuart into the spotlight, please? Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, just a few questions for you, and thank you very much for the information which you provided, which has been very helpful to us. Just to continue on from the question that the Chair has been asking, what's the commercial threshold um, for someone who's uh, not currently in your plans, but might find themselves next door or immediate, immediately adjacent uh, new properties popping up and things like that. So what's the commercial threshold for you to uh, provide service to somebody in those circumstances? Um, secondly, can I ask you, um, and I think I've asked this question before, but now that things are underway, it, it might be clearer. Are, are there any cross-border opportunities or implications for the work that you're doing? And are there points uh, where you're providing or proposing to provide service where that would be easier provided by uh, cooperation with uh, providers in the Republic of Ireland rather than in Northern Ireland? Um, Secondly, and I think you, you really have probably answered this question, I wholly understand the efficiency of rollout, but it may be that you will have two areas side by side, but that the efficiency might dictate that if you haven't got the appropriate uh, way leaves or permissions or uh, the processes aren't in place to deliver in one patch, is it possible to hop over and do another one? Uh, do you have, In other words, do you have some flexibility rather than actually asking for you to do things, but it just want to know what the flexibility is in relation to the efficiency of, of the, 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 the rollout. Um, and finally, uh, while I wholly understand that uh, you're not providing a service in areas where other providers operate, can I clarify for a number of constituents for whom there are microwave links available in their area, uh, do they count as, all, as services that you'll not be competing against? Or um, is it only fixed line services? And therefore, if there's only a microwave link in an area, then fibrous is, is, is possible. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so the commercial threshold, we will endeavor um, to connect premises that we can commercially. I'm not going to disclose what that threshold is, but there, there, there may well be premises that we can acquire as we build the network out that we will pass on the way. We will try our best to pick up as many premises as possible, but if they're not economic, they're not economic. But the rubric of the project is that all the all uneconomic 
premises are swept up by stratum. And as Nigel said, uh, there, there are some anomalies in the model, but, but most premises should be economic once stratum is delivered. Um, so we would be confident that between stratum, clearing up the anomalies, dealing with the final two and a half thousand, and, and, and being able to increasingly connect premises because we've got a deeper a more prolific uh, widespread network, that most premises will find a solution over a reasonably short period of time. In terms of cross-border, members may be aware that I actually ran the business that won the National Broadband Plan, and the Republic's have a good understanding of that network. What I would say is that network is not at the stage of development where you could work with it yet, so you're left with the incumbent network, Aircom. Um, we have actually a good relationship with Aircom. The opportunity exists. There's no political or legal or regulatory barrier to it. The barriers are actually just design and network implementation, different types of protocols, different mm -hmm. uh, different technologies and stuff. So um, we could do that if we felt the need to do it. As it stands today, we haven't felt the need to do it, but we do have a good relationship with both of the major network operators that you'll find uh, south of the border, AR and NDI. Um, in terms of going down, yeah, I'm just going to address that the last two points that Stuart raised around, you know, picking up as many premises as we can. We, as part of our bid, we we identified, I'm not sure the exact number, I think it's between 20 and 25,000 grey premises that, that we could uh, pick up as, as we pass them with the Stratum network. And this, this formed part uh, of our business case uh, when we bid. Um, so yes, we, we will pick up as, as many as we can. Um, and then on the last point around people that currently have have a, perhaps a microwave service tends to be the people that we will be addressing under this, this project. Um, and you know, any, anyone that has that microwave service will be able to probably in the future get, get access from, from our, our uh, service. But I, I should say at this point, for those microwave providers that they do have access to our network to, to serve their customers. So if they currently have a, a service from, from a wireless provider, they can continue to get that service from that provider using our technology if they wish. I, don't like, I, I think I think the, the member's question about rollout plan was uh, it was can we flex the rollout plan if it becomes more efficient to do so, uh, and I think that's a really important point that, that you've identified there. Um, it, it is true that, if, for instance, as, as you said, if there's a way leave issue and we can't get to a certain area, we're not going to leave teams standing around doing nothing. We're going to move those teams onto the next available area, and that may well be. The adjacent area so it might be and i think from an elected reps point of view it's important to say that it might be the plan does change but it will be changing because of what's that which is efficient has changed if that makes sense just to just to add a clarification on the on the microwave link or wireless internet service provider uh, uh, question i know fibers has reached out to um, many of the wireless internet service providers or wisps as we call them you know in the, the spirit of uh, of open and transparent engagement uh, there is a process under state aid rules that uh, require the department to put any citizens who currently avail of a next generation access broadband service so a service over 30 meg uh, into an under review category, uh, which under state aid rules means that the claim, claimed coverage of those WISPs is monitored and measured over a period, and that period ends next year. January, that's three years after public consultation. Um, so that's a process underway. So where we can t test the coverage claims made by those uh, WISPs to ensure that the citizens are indeed uh, receiving or have access to NGA services. If they do not, then those premises would be eligible for intervention or currently under review. Um, and uh, customers, of course, will have uh, a choice in the long term uh, in, in terms of uh, providers. And the open access network, which will be the result of Project Stratum, will mean customers have a choice through many uh, different providers, not only Fibrous, uh, to receive the, the most uh, competitively priced broadband services. Thank you. Can we bring John O'Dowd into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, which was in itself useful, though you know, appreciate the role of the committee is to ensure that there's the right policy being pursued by the department, and there's value for the public purse, and the role of the committee is to scrutinise and also to support the department in doing that. And while 
your, your presentation is useful in the sense of the rollout of the project. Um, I think there's broader, more detailed questions we will have to pursue, uh, perhaps at the day at a later stage. I, I did note in your uh, presentation, in your risk assessment, that uh, rollout plans amendments were low risk. Why are they classified as low risk? Steve? Yeah. Uh, so, so that um, table that we showed you there is the risk of, of them occurring and the impact that they may have on the program is considered to be low in comparison to the other to the other risks. There will be there will be changes to the implementation plan. That's inevitable. Um, you know, there's never there's never been a network rolled out like this where we haven't had to where where anybody hasn't had to change their deployment, the order of deployment and the the uh, the pace of deployment. We we have to ensure that we hit our quarterly premises pass target every quarter. Otherwise, we're not going to hit that March twenty four deadline. So so that's what we have to do. And if we have to change the plan, then we will we will do that. But we'll minimise how often that happens and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll minimise the effect that that has on the communities um, that we're serving. But it will, I guess it will happen at some point. The premises brought on board, would they be mopped up as you're in that area, which may cause a delay to those premises that are at the end of the programme in 2023? Or how, how would that be dealt? Because you would imagine if there's a significant number of premises brought on, that causes your your plan, your business plan to change, or your delivery plan to change significantly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, the um, if we add as we add more premises into the program, we will need more time to complete those premises. Okay, uh, thank you. The program, the program. We don't want to put the program at risk. Uh, by overstretching you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Yeah, thanks, Chair, and obviously thanks to everyone for the presentation. And I do want to put on record, obviously, the thanks uh, to yourselves and the stakeholder engagement piece. I, I think it is important that uh, you keep everybody up to date, and certainly from our own office perspective. Uh, we're grateful for some of the questions that we've raised and answers that uh, we've received. Um, and, and two questions, I suppose, from my point of view. Uh, the first one is around those who have already uh, benefited from this project, those who, who you have already delivered for. Is there feedback in terms of how they, they are now finding um, this new uh, access that they have? My second point. It's around the jobs and skills piece. I think it is very welcome that uh, there has been a significant element of job creation, uh, which is important given the huge amount of uh, money that's been put into this particular project. Uh, the apprenticeship program itself, you've stated that it's in development. Um, and apologies if I have missed this, but in terms of the apprenticeship program, when do you see that been fully been fully ruled out? Who you know will people be able to access that? Are you going to be able, who are you going to be working with to do that? Is it going to be our our colleges or, or you know within the education sector? Uh, if you could just give me some information on that, that'd be um, very good. Thank you. Jim, do you want to take? Um, I'll take I'll take I'll take the first one. Uh, Don, that's absolutely fine. So, uh, in terms of in terms of those that have already. From the, the project thus far, uh, we're due to complete our first our first photography uh, in relation to the rollout itself. Uh, that, that's pretty much complete now at this stage for our first handover of services. Uh, the feedback that we've got thus far from our test customers that have been brought on online uh, within the Coal Island area is that you know the, the service has made a significant difference. Uh, to how they, they currently uh, run their daily lives, uh, both at, at home working level, uh, for school work and so on and so forth. So the, the initial feedback has been has been has been really positive. And as we now uh, deliver our first premises 
uh, were within the Coleman area as live, which we're in the process of, of just completing and, and, and submitting, obviously, up on our, on our hyperfast NI website, then we expect, obviously, for those premises to become ready for service and, and obviously, be fulfilled from an ordering perspective. But, yes, the initial, the initial feedback is really positive in terms of the speeds and the stability and, and difference that the, the, the service makes. And I suppose, Gary, then, on, on your second point around the, the apprenticeships, um, as, I, as I touched on uh, at the start, we have, um, through, through our partners in, in fibre optics, have set up a training and uh, school in, in Coal Island here, and as I believe it, are working closely with the South West Regional College on accreditation for for those skilled operatives those fiber engineering operatives that are critical for for this um, project but also fibrous are, are working closely with with the colleges as well to ensure that we get that uh, interest from from the apprenticeships um, people looking for apprenticeships but also for from from a graduate point of view that we we can assist those people with career opportunities Okay, thank you. Let me bring John Stewart into the spotlight, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. I've got no camera or no sound, so you'll have to hear me and not see me, folks, if that's okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Can, John. <laughs> that's hard anyway. Um, look, folks, thanks so much for your presentation today. It's been really enlightening, and uh, congratulations just on the work so far that's been carried out. I think it's really just good to see you know, from, from the outset on day one that you were on the ground and getting this um, long overdue project um, up and running. Um, and just on behalf of myself and my office and on behalf of my colleagues across the country who have been engaging with you, I think all have said to me that they've been very impressed with just how engaging you have been and willing to answer any of the questions and queries that they've had or their constituents have had. So um, long may that continue. Um, a couple of most of my issues, to be fair, have been dealt with already, um, Chair. But just a couple of points um, in terms of um, what, what, what you maybe described as pinch points in those more congested areas where work's taking place. How do you go about engaging with communities? We often hear where um, utilities are being rolled out. There can be difficulties on the ground. Just just wonder how you engage with communities where you, when you're rolling out the the hardware on the grounds. Um, secondly, is about um, the hardest to reach dwellings. I'm just curious to get a feel for those farms that are most isolated and most uh, most away from um, the network itself. You know, what engagement do you have with individual householders to try and connect them right up? And um, finally, in terms of ongoing maintenance down the line, I'm assuming there will be an element of damage as there is with all networks. And what commitment do Fibrous have and, and funding do you have for ongoing maintenance of the network as time goes by? Thanks, folks, in advance. All right. Uh, so I, I'll take the first, and, and maybe, Steve, you'll take the second around the, the hardest, hardest to reach. But uh, in terms of of the pinch points, um, John, and, and where where we probably have to to perform some civil work and and um, be in those communities and, and where there's there might be some disruption. We we have, as Shane outlined earlier, a, uh, an engagement plan that includes um, what we refer to as fibre ambassadors, and those fibre ambassadors we work closely with the, the local community. The local councillors to ensure that the local community knows exactly what's taking place and that where there is disruption that that disruption is, is kept to a minimum and she that, that, that in, in terms of of those fiber ambassadors where the, these people are currently being recruited at the moment yeah that's, yeah. that's absolutely right the the, the, the fiber ambassadors uh, we, we we've got one in, one in, in in situ and we've a further two to be added in uh, during the month of may uh, and their role is so so important in in determining how successful we are from a rollout perspective within each of the communities. Their their job, first of all, is to ensure the communities are kept abreast uh, as we go into to, to build a network within their areas. But it's also liaison with DFI roads, the local planning agencies, and so on and so forth, environmental agencies, to ensure that everyone is kept abreast of of how the build itself is is being rolled out, what roads are impacted potentially. Point John uh, for things like traffic management and so on and so forth, uh, and, and and when those those uh, those particular traffic management 
uh, facilities and stuff that can be put in place to ensure that we can we can build a network obviously on time. So as I say, a lot a lot of a lot of work uh, has went into uh, building uh, what we believe to be a very robust uh, stakeholder and communications plan. Uh, and and I'm pleased, as I say, to to report that that's that's now obviously being rolled out in, in full flow uh, for for any of the geographies that we are currently in and any of the new ones that we're planning to come in. Do you want to take that or do you want me to take that? You can go for it, come here. <laughs> I'm going to explore the limits of my expertise. Um, so, 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 I mean, effectively, the network, um, once built, it, it becomes more, a much more of a commercial entity as opposed to subsidized entity. I mean, there, are, there, there's an element of operating cost support in there, but, but, you know, we will be generating revenue on that network forever. And in order to generate net re revenue on the network, John, we'll need to keep the network up and running. So it will be in our interest, it will be in commercially in our interest to keep that network up and running. It, it, there are also obligations, for instance, on open reach, where, as I think we said, uh, we will be using for the vast majority of the distance of this network, we will be utilizing open, re open reaches, poles and holes. Uh, they will have obligations to us in return for the rent that we will pay them for those poles and holes. So there's a significant service level regime in there, both within the stratum contract, but also necessary to deliver the services that we need to generate the revenue, to generate our return on the network. And then there's a significant obligation on open reach. I don't know if, if that makes sense, John, does it? Okay, thank you. Um, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Or is it? Good morning. Yeah, just about. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation and your update to both uh, the department team and to the, the fibers team. And I have to say, it's pretty impressive, the scaling up and, uh, and the speed of the scaling up uh, for fibers itself. So well done to, to all of the team. And um, I really do uh, welcome uh, the engagement that has taken place as well within the website, and the postcode checker, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that, that, that's good work. Whenever um, the, some of the figures earlier on, we talked about um, 35,000 premises have been covered to date. What does that mean? Does that mean that they are actually up and running now, the fibers there, and they're able to access um, broadband speeds uh, that are greater? Or, or what just technically does 35,000 um, premises mean? Because I mean, that's pretty significant rollout in a very short space of time. And then the other, the other question that I want to ask is, um, in relation to the 2,517 premises that are not currently scheduled uh, for uh, deployment, uh, what, what will that? What will the impact of that mean in in, in, in terms of the timing um, of, of the rollout? Will that put back uh, delivery in any aspect, or will that be able to be just rolled on within the current time frame? Um, I'm just quite interested in, in that aspect. And then the, the, the final uh, question is, um, again, it's really about, you know, um, the scaling up. Have you had difficulties in recruitment? Have you had any difficulties in the skill sets that you require? Um, and or, or is, uh, has it been a good recruitment process with, with, with plenty of people uh, with the appropriate skills available to you? Just uh, out of interest um, regarding all of, that, all of the recruitment process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, just, I'll, I'll address the first point and and I'll ask Stephen and, and Connell on, on the scaling up. So, in terms of the thirty five thousand premises that were mentioned earlier, uh, Sinead, those are commercially delivered premises that that we have delivered over the last year and a half as part of our own commercially funded program. And I think that's important to say that aside from Project Stratum, um, we have um, which we have termed our own. A project, Project Acorn, 150,000 premises in scope to be delivered over the next two and a half to three years. And of that, we have delivered 35. So as of today, there's 35,000 homes and businesses here that can access full fiber broadband. And many of those, as I said earlier, are rural and regional parts um, of NI um, 
typically those that have been underserved with, with connectivity before. Um, so on, on the 2517, Steve, you maybe can, can explain the process of how those would be introduced to the rollout and how, it, how it wouldn't actually impact the, the delivery of the program. Yeah, so um, as, you, as you've seen, the program that we've currently got to deliver Stratton by March 2024 is very tight, very ambitious, and um, we, we can't add too much more into that. So the, if we if we can um, get to the point where we ha we add in the two five one seven, then we will need extra time on the end of the program to deliver those premises. Um, we'll obviously be looking at ways to deliver um, some of them as early as we can, but inevitably we'll need more time on the end of the program. Yeah, Colin, you're going to take the scaling up and the scale. Yeah, Shanid, that's a really good question, and um, you know, we, we, I mean, I think um, somebody earlier referred to us as a startup. We are a startup, but but I think the experience within the organisation is significant. You know, across the team that you've covered today, but but well beyond that. So we we, we there are clearly challenges associated with creating a, a, a machine of this size and scale from a standing start. Um, but we we are getting through it. We're getting it done. We've recruited. We've had. I have to say, we've had a great time in terms of recruiting the Fibers team. The quality of team that we've been able to grow has been outstanding. Uh, genuinely impressed with the quality, caliber, and the commitment. Um, and in terms of bringing in the skills, there, there, there definitely aren't enough skills in the market to build fiber networks as it stands today. So we've embarked on a very clear and very structured program of growing our own and providing our own tra uh, training and development for people within with, with, uh, through that. Uh, a lot of it through uh, that company Fiber Optics that we spoke about before, but our other um, network partners in Charles Brand and at KN are also heavily invested in developing and training people. So has it been easy? No. Are we worried that we're not going to get it done? No. You know, we, 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 we think, you know, it, it's good. Uh, and we also think that we'll end up having built this project with a, with a really, really world-class broadband company uh, built and based here in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Um, I think everybody who has wanted to ask questions has now um, done so. So look, thank you very much for the update. I'm sure at some point in the, in the future we'll want to get a further briefing um, to get a feel for how things are progressing. But um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, we are moving back into closed session sure, yeah. um, <laughs> for our next agenda item. So yeah, thank I, you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, committee. Bye-bye. Thanks. Northern Ireland Assembly, committee room 30. Okay, um, so we're moving on then to item number five, which is chair's business. So, Tommy, if you bring everybody up into the spotlight, please. Thank okay, you. thank you. We're back. Oh, yeah. So, 5.1 then, at um, there is correspondence at page 50 of your pack between um, the chair and the minister regarding the Economic Recovery Action Plan and the importance of a collective approach across the executive to economic recovery. So I just wanted to seek members' agreement to schedule a uh, ministerial briefing on the um, Economic Recovery Plan. Are members content to do that? Great. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on then to 5.2 at page 54 of the pack. Um, members will remember that we had asked uh, Peter to do a meeting with Include Youth regarding essential skills. Um, we then had further correspondence from Include Youth around their strife program and around yeah. peace funding. Peace funding as well, sure, and so yeah. Peter has discussed these these various issues with um, Include Youth, and there is a readout of the meeting there in the packs. But me, Peter's going to speak to this as well. <coughs> Excuse me, I've chaired the Include Youth Essential Skills program. Is um, undertaken across 10 sites and for the, the past three years they've had funding from the lottery but the lottery won't do a fourth funding award so essentially the funding for these programs will run out in December. What they're seeking is is some core funding from the department. They estimate the cost at about 300k a year so that would be 900k over a three-year period. Um, 
what we, we sort of looked at was how this fits into the department's wider um, skills program and the idea of trying to bridge the skills gap. So really what Include Youth is, is doing is reaching the young people who are not part of the, the mainstream system, if you like. They, they've not um, come out of school with qualifications and they're not engaged in FE or HE. So it's, it's bringing the essential skills to them so they get half a day uh, a week on each of numeracy, literacy and ICT. And it means it brings it right down into their communities. So it's easily accessible, it's not intimidating, and the, the whole basis of the design is to really give the skills to the young people who, who have not been able to engage with traditional educational models. So, Chair, what, what I had sort of thought, and, and the, the Strive and Peace programmes as well, is they're, they're doing a lot of work that is complementing what the department already funds. It's just they're doing it at a much, I suppose, granular, that new word, granular level. They're doing it within communities. So it's, it's that filling the gap. It's that bridging the gap with skills. Um, and really what they're asking for is that funding to be mainstreamed and, and part of the department's programme for skills and to be core funded. So the suggestion, Chair, is um, to, to potentially write to the minister and see if that's something the department would look at being able to do because it's, as I say, it's, it's getting those skills programmes into the places where the department's mainstream programmes don't reach. Yeah, so are members content that we would do that? Um, and I, I, I know various members will be aware of, of the types of skills programmes that are being delivered by Include Youth and, and other organisations, and they are, are really important in terms of reaching those young people who, who haven't been able to engage with mainstream education for, for whatever reason. Um, Peter, it might also be useful for us to copy that correspondence to the education and health committees because I think they also have, or those departments also would have some interest or role in relation to these types of programmes as well. Yeah, Chair, that, that's something I should have mentioned. Uh, include youth have in, engaged with both those departments. Again, there is funding available in both of them for essential skills. Uh, potentially, you could also look at communities as well, but it's, it's getting that... Um, cross-departmental work so that all of the the people who need this support are identified in a more um, holistic way. Should we also then copy it to the Education and yeah. Health and Community Ministers? I think that's probably the best way to go about that, Chair. Are members um, content that we, we do that? Yep, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to 5.3, there is a clerk's memo at page 59 of the PAC summarising the informal meeting with um, Ulster University's Vice-Chancellor. Um, there are some issues there that members will be familiar with. We had a good discussion around um, planning for when campus is able to reopen, some issues to do with um, admissions for next year and, and I suppose more more generally looking slightly longer term um, around the, the sustainable funding models and, and things like that that members will all, all be very um, aware of. Anyway, Peter, there, it might also be useful for us to engage with the, the colleges around um, assessments and, and, and admissions because we know the minister announced there would be no formal exams. Yeah. So just to see, get some feedback from the colleges around Absolutely the right. awarding process and um, admissions for the next academic year as well. I think probably the fastest way to get that done is do it on the same basis as the universities and, and bring them in for an informal. Probably get that done pretty quickly and it, it'll give members yeah. that fully rounded picture. Are members content that we would do that? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And then... Chair. Sorry, Chair, can I ask a question there? When was the last time the Minister actually came towards or came to committee? I think it, was it was before Christmas. It was the last meeting before Christmas. So we're we're gonna schedule in um uh, Minister to come to talk to us about the economic, economic recovery, recovery plan. action plan. Uh, so hopefully we'll and get what that. Then done do you think that she's gonna get or gonna take her to get in front of the committee? We, we, we put in our request, that's, that's usually how we do We make the request that the committee's agreed to get uh, the Minister in to talk about that. So I'm hoping we can do that fairly quickly. 
Yeah, because you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues now that we just need direct answers. Even some of this around um, her engagement with the universities in relation to you know accommodation, um, obviously student funding and everything else. But it, it would be um, opportune now, I think, for her to come uh, in front of the committee in 2021, since we haven't seen her since last year. Thanks. Thank you. So moving on then to 5.4, um, there is a report, the NI College of the Future report at page 63 of your pack. This is a, a UK-wide initiative to plan for the future needs of colleges from, 20, from 2030 onwards. So this is obviously something that the committee has would want to have a look at um, since it really fits in with our work around the skills strategy. So it's just for members to note at this stage and we'll bring it back with yeah, Chair, Once we work. see the skills strategy and also once we start talking about the FE and HE reviews uh, and the level four and five review, this should be quite useful because it, it does project into the future about where our gaps are and the sort of model we, we need to look at. It may be also worth members reflecting on the stakeholder group between FE and HE and the discussions they're having around a more integrated and collaborative approach to education provision. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so we're moving on then to item number seven, which is... No, we're not. We're moving to... We're going to go, Chair, to Sorry. um item number... Nine. Nine, legislation. So we're moving to item number nine, which is the SL1, the Employment Rights NI Order 1996, Protection from <laughs> Suffering Detriment in Health and Safety Cases, Amendment Order NI 2021. There is a clerk's memo at page 546 of your pack, and the SL1 is at page 548. So this uh, legislation would replicate a uh, statutory instrument in Britain, the Employment Rights Act 1996, Protection from Detriment in Health and Safety Cases, Amendment Order 2021. The amendments to the principal regulations are made necessary as a result of a High Court ruling in the judicial review brought by the Independent Workers' Union of Great Britain against the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions and the Health and Safety Executive in Britain in October 2020. In the decision, the Court found that the Health and Safety Framework Directive and the PPE Directive apply to a wider group of workers, not just employees. As a result, changes are necessary to the Employment Rights Act 1996 in Britain and also to the Employment Rights NI Order 1996 here in the North. So this rule will come into operation on the 31st of May um, and it is subject to confirmatory resolution procedure. So this is the committee's opportunity to, um, to consider the policy as laid out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend uh, once the rule has been made and laid in the, um, the Assembly Business Office. So are members content with the... Um, with the policy proposal, so basically it will provide the same level of protection to the likes of agency workers as it does to employees, yeah, so it's, it's a positive move. Um, also people who are employed on the basis of self-employment, self -employment um, contracts. Gig, gig workers, workers, all that kind of thing. Yeah. So are members content with that policy direction? Yep, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so moving on then to item number 10, there is the SL1 Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Suspension of Liability for Wrongful Trading Regulations NI 2021. There is a clerk's memo at page 555 and an SL1 at page 556. This statutory rule is to extend until the 30th of June 2021 a temporary immunity for company directors from being held personally liable as a consequence of decisions to allow companies which are insolvent to continue trading. The rule will come into operation on the 30th of April 2021. It's subject to confirmatory resolution procedure um, and it's the committee's opportunity to consider the policy as laid out in the SL1 because it's not possible to amend once it has been laid. So this is similar to a number that we've already dealt with in relation to the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act. So are members content with the policy direction? Thank you. Thank you. So moving on then to item number 11, it's the SL1, the Administration Restrictions on Disposal, etc. to Connected Persons Regulations, NI um, 2021. So there's a clerk's memo at page 560 um, and then an SL1 at page 561. This statutory rule is to prevent the company's business or assets being sold or otherwise disposed of. 
um, to anyone connected with the company during the first eight weeks of an administration unless certain conditions are met. The rule will come into operation in, by June 2021. It's subject to draft affirmative procedure and it's the committee's opportunity to consider the policy um, as laid out in the SL1. Um, so, Peter, is there anything you want to say about that one? No, Chair, again, this is part of that suite to protect um, companies and directors and so on um, from the normal administration or insolvency processes being um, enacted. It's, it's part of the whole kind of COVID protection so that businesses aren't um, being pushed into administration um, under the current sort of restrictions and conditions when they would otherwise be viable. So it allows them to continue to run, whereas previously under uh, the rules that were there before, they would have been forced into administration. So this is just extending this temporary protection. So this is a temporary one as this is, well? Yeah, this is temporary again, Chair. Okay. Okay. That's grand. Are members content then? Enough. with? Yeah, thank you. So moving on then to item number 12, there is an SR 2021-000, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Change of Expiry Date in Section 32.1 Regulations at NI 2021. There's a clerk's memo at page 565 and the SR at page 567. This SR extends by one year until the 29th of April 2022, the period during which the Department or the British Secretary of State can exercise power under Section 28 of the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 to make regulations. This rule will come into operation on the 29th of April. It is subject to draft affirmative resolution procedure um, and it was debated and affirmed yesterday in the plenary session. So this one is for members to simply note. Yeah. Okay, so I we moving on then to item number 13, which is the SR 2021-73, the Employment Rights Increase of Limits Order NI 2021. There is a clerk's memo at page 574 and the SR is at page 576. This statutory rule revises the limits on awards and payments under certain employment rights legislation in line with the rate of inflation. Article 33.2 of the 1999 Order provides the limits on various statutory awards and payments under employment rights legislations are index linked. It requires the department to modify these limits to reflect the annual percentage change in the retail prices index between one September and the next. In this instance, the order revises limits in accordance with the change in ERPI from September 2019 to 2020. Article 33.3 requires the department to round sums to the nearest whole pound, taking 50p as the next whole pound above. So the rule will come into operation on the 6th of April 2021. The rule is subject to a laying requirement, but not any assembly proceedings. Um, the examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on the rule, so members will be agreeing to the legislation subject to the examiner statutory rules report. So are members content with the SR and we'll put the question. Thank you. Yep. Right. The Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2021-73, the Employment Rights Increase of Limits Order Northern Ireland 2021 and has no objection to the rules subject to the examiner statutory rules report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on then to item 14, SR 2021-75, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Amendment of Certain Relevant Periods Regulations, NI 2021. There is a clerk's memo at page 585 and the SR at page 586. This statutory rule will extend the periods during which some temporary modifications to corporate insolvency legislation that were included in the SIG Act will apply until the 30th of June. The modifications are restrictions on the use of statutory demands and winding up petitions and a small supplier exemption from termination clause provisions. The rule came into operation on the 29th of March 2021. The rule is subject to a lay-in requirement but not any assembly proceedings. So the um, examiner of statutory rules has not reported in this rule, so members will also be agreeing legislation subject to the examiner's report. So if members are content, I'll put the question. 
that the Committee mm -hmm. for the Economy has considered the SR 2021-75, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Amendment of Certain Relevant Periods Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 and has no objection to the rules subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. So moving on then, item number 15 is the SR 2021-85 the Education Student Fees and Support Amendment No. 2 Regulations NIE 2021. There is a Clerk's Memo at page 593 and the SR at page 595. So this statutory rule will amend legislation which makes provision about or in connection with student finance. Two sets of student support regulations are amended. Those regulations are the Education Student Support No. 2 Regulations, NI 2009, the 2009 Regulations, and the Student Fees, Qualifying Courses and Persons Regulations, NI 2007, the 2007 QCP Regulations. Uh, we had sought some clarification. Members will remember from the Department that there will be no change of status for students from the South as home fee payers. We considered the revised SL1 at the meeting on the 23rd of March. The rule will come into operation on the 20th of April and it is subject to negative resolution procedure. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on this rule, so members will again be agreeing to the legislation subject to the examiner's report. So our members contempt and will put the, the question. So that the Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2021-85, the Education Student Fees and Support Amendment No. 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and has no objection to the rule, subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report. That's all of our legislation. All the legislation. Chair, we have about slightly less than 10 minutes. If you want to go back to Matters Matters Sorry, Chair. Yeah, so, go ahead, John. Before, before we move off SRs and SL1s, has there been any response from the Minister to the committee's correspondence from her last meeting uh, asking her to set out uh, SL1 or SR to broaden the scope for those students who are entitled to the COVID disruption payments? Chair, we've not yet had a response to that. Um, members also remember we wrote to the executive about that as well, but neither has responded thus far. Um, if members are content, we can ask if the um, at what point that correspondence was, because obviously it, it gets logged within a department, and there, there's a like a registered process of of that response being made. So we can um, bring back information on just exactly where in the process that is. So, so just an additional point on that. Um, I note that NSUI have are expressed his appointment that the Minister has in time in her diary to meet them. Would the committee be agreeable to write to the Minister asking her to make space in her diary for a meeting with student unions representatives on this issue and other issues? Yep. I mean, if we can do that, yep. Are members content? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Moving on then to matters arising at 7.1, page 187 of your pack, there's a response from the Minister regarding financial assistance from, for independent wedding venues. The Minister states that wedding venues were eligible for the recently announced £178 million of business support grants from the Finance Minister and a further 12 months rates relief. Um, are members content that we would seek or that we would forward this correspondence on to um, wedding venue owners who've contacted the committee. And Peter, can I just add an additional point? Um, being contacted by some travel agents who they are, they ha there is the travel agent yeah. scheme now set up, but who aren't able to access the CRBSS um, by some quirk of what is deemed to be the supply chain. So um, it's something we could seek to write to the minister on because. As we all know, they have been particularly impacted by the the uh, the pandemic and their very limited ability to trade. So, could we seek to raise that issue? If members are content. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, at seven point two, then page one hundred and eighty nine, there's a briefing paper from the department on the twenty twenty one twenty two budget. The committee was presented with an overview of the draft budget and the impact for DFE on the 10th of February. 
The final budget was approved by the Executive on the 1st of April and the DFE budget did not change from the draft position presented to the Committee. So are members content that we will seek a briefing on the budget from the Department? Thank you. Okay, moving on, 7.3 at page 194 of your pack, there is a response from the Department on how the Community Renewal Fund will be delivered. The, the British Government has announced the provision of £220 million through the UK Community Renewal Fund. Um, it is proposed that this will be used in 2021-22 to prepare for the wider UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Delivery will be directly by the British Government via the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. The Executive will have no role in determining who receives funding. Applications will be sought directly from any eligible body. Um, there is a divergence between the approach being taken to the delivery in Britain and what is proposed for here in the North. Britain um, will have specified, or sorry, specific designated areas, 100 are being prioritised for support. A lead authority has been identified in each of these places to assist. But here in the North, in recognition of the limited barriers of our local government sector, this role is being removed. So the Department states that there are clear implications for DFE as the main policy department affected, and as such, we will continue to make representations to the Minister for Housing, Communities and Local Government in Britain to try to mitigate the risks that we have already highlighted in terms of duplication in funding and misalignment to our programme for government objectives. So are members content that we would seek or that we would share the response with the U EU Affairs Manager and also that we would write to the Finance Minister to ask about the input that the Department of Finance is having around design and distribution of the Community Renewal Fund and the approach that's being taken in other devolved administrations. And I, I think even from what the Department is saying, there are, are significant concerns as to how this is being rolled out and to basically how the executive is being bypassed in terms of the delivery of funding. And uh, I think that there are implications for devolution um, in the, the grander scheme of things with this approach. Um, I, I, is there any other potential actions, Peter, that we could look well, to? Chair, I, th I think the, the very clear issue there is, is as the, the Department has highlighted, that if they, they don't have a role in the allocation of this money, members will be aware that previously ESF funding went through the Department. Therefore, it could be aligned with Programme for Government, with other policies and so on, whereas with this allocation... Um, None of that is brought to play, and the, the minister has flagged up um, the issues that the executive will have with that because it's money flowing in that is is not linked to anything else. Uh, there is no kind of local input to the criteria or anything like that. So it's hard to see how that money would then feed into wider policy imperatives. And I think that's that's what the departments of the minister has particularly flagged up. Um, so it, it may even be a case too of um, highlighting the issue to the executive, bringing it up at executive level, um, where this is is going to potentially have an impact on um, you know funding of policies that previously you, you could have taken for granted that there would have been a role uh, within obviously criteria and parameters with EU funding, um, but that that it fitted local policy imperatives that no longer exist, that, that link no longer exists. Are members content that we would do that, that we would write to the executive in relation to the concerns around how this is being delivered? Thank you. Okay, so moving on then, 7.4, at page 196, um, there's a response from the Department on the status of maintenance grants. The Department states that maintenance grants are demand-led, means-tested grants paid for from the Department's resource Dell budget, and there are no plans currently to review maintenance grants for NA domicile students, um, which isn't a very um, welcome response because they have not had any uplift, I think, since 2015, or at least 2015. Um. Chair, part of the, the, the thing around this is there is a scheduled review of um, funding 
and the, the assumption would be that this would be part and parcel of that, um, because if you if part of the the idea behind the um, skills strategy is to broaden, widen, heighten, and expand the skills base, then it is going to require a, a level of funding for um, all kinds of postgraduate study. This was something actually a number of years ago that um, Daddy looked at. And it was recognised that, you know, the funding provided for PhDs and other postgraduate study, the, the multiplier effect was, you know, absolutely enormous for that. So there's an issue there, Chair, around um, people having that ability to be supported through that postgraduate study that's going to be essential for the, um, the, the increased prosperity of the uh, economy. Young people aren't going to be willing to do that if they aren't going to get support. They're going to be forced to go into jobs otherwise because they, they won't be able to get the, the kind of financial support they need. So, Chair, the committee has looked at this before and discussed how this needs to be part of that review of funding. We have a funding paper um, for higher education coming at the end of the month, and this might be an opportunity to widen out that discussion so that we have something kind of potentially more concrete to give to the Minister on that. Okay. Chair, can I come in? Yeah, go ahead, um, um I, like I'm sure many other MLAs, have been contacted by constituents in relation to this. Um, uh, this issue, it is really, um, we lack competitiveness here in, in our ability to retain our students or even attract them back again um, if they've chosen to go to GB universities because of our maintenance grants. So I think, you know, um, it's incumbent upon when we are doing a review that um, all aspects, um, support and grants are um, put into that review as well. Um, so, so we need to kind of take that on board. Yeah. Okay, Peter, well, we'll look to bring it yeah, So, back. Chair, when we bring back the paper, we'll bring this up uh, as an issue. It would be useful to get a a committee position on this that can then go to the uh, minister. Okay, uh, members, we we're going to have to leave it there for yeah. today. So we're going to deal with the rest of the items via correspondence, um, and so Peter and the team will will share that later. Okay, yep, chair, we'll do that. Okay, so we'll just move then to um, item number seventeen. Any other business? None has been indicated. So we are then going to go to the date, time and place of the next meeting, which is next Wednesday, the 21st of April in room 30. Um, and just to remind members, there is an informal meeting tomorrow morning at 11 with Hospitality Ulster on its recovery action plan. So if members are agreed, we'll adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is 